welcome to our talk, uh, TypeScript fans, Kotlin JS adventures. Should you make the switch? So uh, my name is Eamon Boyle. I'm one of the trainers at a company called Instill. This is Garth. Say hello, Garth. Hi there. Uh, and Instill is a software development company uh, based out of Ireland, and uh, we also do consultancy and training, and that's where our Garth and myself uh, are uh, primarily based. Uh, so. Garth, Garth and me were both uh, big TypeScript and Kotlin fans. We we love them because what we what we like about them they're nice languages, but they solve real problems. Um, so neither tries to reinvent the wheel, which happens a lot in our industry. Um, there's a lot of waste in our in our industry, but both of these languages are a lot more pragmatic. So TypeScript builds upon JavaScript which in a lot of metrics is the most popular programming language out today. It's, it's really ubiquitous. It runs everywhere. Uh, it's got a massive community. There's lots of knowledge out there. And rather than throwing that away, TypeScript builds upon that and brings what I like to think of as like a sanity layer. It adds static types and compilation so that we can have a much better development experience, uh, autocompletes, IntelliSense, you know, uh, refactoring, navigation, all of that good stuff, real-time error checking. Uh, so that's, that's a really nice solution, good engineering. Uh, but we also love uh, Kotlin as well. And again, Kotlin solves a problem. So on the Java virtual machine, there's a problem. And for me, that problem is Java. From using other languages, I get quite frustrated when I use Java, although I have to say that the situation uh, is getting better. So Kotlin basically gives us a modern, pragmatic, succinct language, uh, but it doesn't again throw away all that Java goodness because there's lots of community out there. There's lots of really good code, lots of really good uh, libraries and frameworks and tools out there. And Kotlin builds upon that so that you can reuse those assets, interop as a design goal, uh, the learning curve is easy. So it's just, it's just a really, really good uh, solution to a problem, okay? Um, so we just see both of these languages as, as improving on what came before. And Kotlin is, a, is an interesting one because they're really going after um, all spaces. So we start off with Kotlin and JVM. Now it's probably more popular and, and well known for being uh, the, uh, the first choice for, for Android. Uh, but you can also build Kotlin native and, and develop apps for native uh, scenarios, uh, maybe um, uh, low memory footprint and things like that there. And more importantly, iOS, uh, but you can also do Kotlin for JavaScript platforms, so browser and Node.js and uh, things like that there. And that's what really we're, we're looking at here because we know Kotlin quite well internally, we use it internally, but we want to give sort of Kotlin JS a fair shake. So what's the experiment that we're going to run? Well, we wrote an app and we wrote it in TypeScript and we wrote it in Kotlin JS just to compare what the experiences were like because uh, we know TypeScript and use it quite a lot. Uh, we love Kotlin, so what's it like in the JS flavor? And we wanted to go beyond Hello World. So we wanted to incorporate some libraries. We wanted to build something that involved us writing a bit more code and then we could do uh, a better comparison. But we also wanted to keep it fun. That's a big part of it because otherwise it gets very boring. So what did we do? Uh, we created a, a, a bash out clone. Okay, so we did this for a Kotlin native workshop that we did. So we thought we'd do the same thing again, uh, but with Kotlin JS. So this is using uh, you know WebGL. It's all 3D, uh, and uh, to make it even more fun, I got my kids involved. So Bling. listen, beep. Uh, they're doing the sound effects with me. Boop. And if I uh, die, Boop. I'm very good at this game, which makes it difficult for me to die in it. Uh, Beep. No, don't, don't see that there. I almost won again. Boop. If we die. Aww. So we had lots of fun with that there, and, and uh, they created levels and stuff. That's my daughter's name. Uh, so we had, we had a lot of fun with it. That's my son uh, playing it. Um, so the app is a bit more than Hello World, okay? We're using React, which is a really common framework. We're using Redux which is really good for managing state within uh, React. And then I'm not a gamer. This is not a stack that you would use for building uh, games, really. Um, and I, I don't know that much about 3D. So I'm using a library called React 3 Fiber, which is really, really nice. It allows us to create 3D scenes declaratively. So here I'm creating a mesh using React-like syntax, and it is bound to a position. And then when the position changes in the normal way that state changes in React and Redux, the 3D scene updates automatically. So it's a really nice framework. So Garth, if you want to take us through creating a Kotlin.js project. 
Absolutely. So the good news is that these days Kotlin JS is fully integrated into IntelliJ. So you just have to say, uh, I want a new project. And then these days you're going to choose Gradle for your build file. And then you can choose Kotlin JS for browser. So that's going to build a project uh, with built in support for React. Um, other options, if you were doing something server side or if something that was just completely standalone, uh, you might go for the Node.js option there. Or something that's uh, increasingly important these days, you might go for a multi-platform project. So that would be where uh, you had entity classes and business logic and so on, and you wanted to share those across uh, a wide range of different UIs, you know, potentially all the, the platforms that Kotlin supports these days. And then if you see there up at the top, a nice little detail, uh, you're no longer going to be using the Groovy uh, based DSL uh, that comes with Gradle. Instead, we're going to be using the Kotlin based one. So that's been the standard for uh, almost two years now. So it's going to be Kotlin all the way through. Uh, and then if we look at the build file that you get, so you can see there at the top, we're using the JavaScript flavor of the Kotlin standard library. And then you already have Kotlin JS wrappers around uh, the core React architecture, that's React, and React to run inside the browser, that's React DOM. And now Kotlin JS has built in support for coroutines as well. You know, So you're, uh, you're immediately given the essentials that you need. And then for the other things, like uh, Eamon was mentioning React 3 Fiber there, well, then you can bring them in through the the NPM function. So you see there, you just give the name of the uh, the node package and the version, and then that NPM function will bring it in for you, you know, just like in a package.json. So that's really cool. Uh, and then this will be uh, immediately self-evident to anybody who's ever done React before. So you see here, we're using the uh, the Kotlin version of the document object. So we're getting the bit of the page with an ID of root, and we're feeding that into React's render function. So that means that that's going to be the bit of the page where it's going to put the output of our tree of components. And in the center there, uh, we're initializing, we're, we're running the app component, which by convention is the, uh, the, the main component in the tree, but we've wrapped that call up in a call to provider uh, because we're going to be using Redux as our data store. And of course, we, uh, we need to specify that. So all very nice. So just to kick off our, uh, our comparison, uh, round one, let's just talk about the two communities and how large they are and friendly and available and so on. So obviously both Kotlin and TypeScript are very, very large languages, you know, very popular. Uh, but uh, as Eamon was saying with Kotlin, it's best known on the JVM. So it started out in Android and then expanded beyond that. Uh, so these days you've got people doing um, server-side development with KTOR, the microservices framework. You've got Coin for dependency injection. Uh, you've got Kotlas for serverless and the cloud and so on, but it's all based around JVM. So there are a few people doing Kotlin native as well and so on, but whenever you're talking Kotlin these days, you're mostly talking JVM. Whereas TypeScript, of course, that's you know uh, uh, entirely going to be built on top of JavaScript. So uh, as you can see there, um, TypeScript adoption is incredibly strong. Uh, lots of people are trying it out. You know, you don't have a choice if you're doing things like Angular, uh, but even more important than the rate of adoption is the rate of people who like it, you know, and want to go back to it. And uh, that was definitely our experience. You know, we've both been doing JavaScript for uh, an uncomfortable number of decades now. And uh, the, the fact that you can uh, do JavaScript, but this time you've got types and you've got interfaces and you've got generics and and so on. And uh, you've got the IDE to spot all your stupid mistakes at 3 a.m. in the morning. You know, we, uh, uh, we love it to bits. Yeah. So for this particular round, uh, we'd have to give it to TypeScript, you know. So uh, TypeScript is definitely more popular than Kotlin JS. Uh, the, the transfer is going to be easier. You know, you can, uh, you can take all of your JavaScript knowledge and incrementally introduce TypeScript. Uh, you know, you wouldn't have that with Kotlin JS. Obviously, it would be a different syntax, unless, as sometimes happens, you know, you're uh, an experienced server side developer in Kotlin or, or Android developer, and you're trying to make the transition to the browser, but that's not going to be the, the majority of people, you know, so, uh, so round one, yeah, has to get given to, uh, to TypeScript. And then round two, uh, let's just think about the interoperability. So if we go back to the build file there, uh, as we've already said, you can use the NPM function to go out and bring in any uh, node package, and that works really well. But then the question becomes, I mean, how, is, how easy is it to consume that code? And the answer is actually uh, very easy indeed. <laughs> yeah. So all you need to do is create a, a Kotlin file, and then you can use the JS module annotation at the top there to specify the NPM package 
package. So here we're bringing in React 3 Fiber. And then you just give Kotlin declarations for all the things that you want to use. But you put the external keyword on the left-hand side to say that we're, we're only declaring these things. We're not going to define them. You know, the, uh, the definitions will be in the, uh, the NPM module. But of course, that's work and nobody likes work, you know, so uh, well, wouldn't it be nice if uh, there was a, a way of sidestepping that? Well, you can because most JavaScript libraries these days already have TypeScript wrappers, you know, so people have gone out and done TypeScript type declarations uh, for the, the things in the JavaScript library, if the library is not already written in TypeScript, you know. So uh, wouldn't it be nice if we had a, a magic tool uh, that could take TypeScript declarations and convert them to Kotlin? ones. Yeah. And uh, that's what Ducat uh, does for us. Uh, not the Cardassian prefect of Bajor, you know that the power wraiths won't be helping us out on this one, but uh, it's a little tool that JetBrains wrote uh, that, as I say, will take your TypeScript type definitions and convert them into Kotlin JS ones. And if you just uh, scan the code here, you can see that we've got some TypeScript at the top and the equivalent Kotlin JS at the bottom. So uh, it looks like it's done a good job. And to be fair, it does. Uh, but you're going to have speed bumps. You know, it's going to be an imperfect process. So as you can see here, uh, field one at the top was mapped as, to, uh, as being read only. And then down the bottom, it's declared with var. You know, might be nicer if it was val instead. So there's going to be these, uh, these little issues. And uh, the, uh, the more advanced features of TypeScript that you use, uh, the, the bigger the problems are going to get. So TypeScript is pioneering uh, the use of structural typing in the industry. And that's a whole chat in its own right. But it means that you can do weird stuff like type mappings. Yeah. So you see here, we can create a my read only of T. What? Okay, so uh, let's say we had a, a data type called foo uh, with properties called bar and z, you know, when bar was a string and z was a number. Well, if we did a, a my read only of foo, well, then we'd get a new data type created and that data type would have properties called bar and z and their data types would be string and number, but they would be read only. So on the fly, we would have created a new type, which was a mapped version of t. Uh, where all the properties were the same, except that now they were read only. You know, so this ability to do mapped types is uh, a big and increasingly important thing in modern TypeScript. So Kotlin looks at this and goes, what? <laughs> you know, so uh, you, you see there, it's just fallen back on the, uh, the, the universal base type of, uh, of any, you know, so that's, a, uh, that's an issue and it's going to be an increasing issue as TypeScript develops. So uh, th there's other things that Kotlin JS can do. So uh, there's a dynamic keyword built into Kotlin JS, and that can get you out of uh, certain awkward corners. And there's also a built-in function called JS object, where uh, you pass in a lambda with some property declarations, and uh, it'll produce JavaScript objects in the fly. Okay, so that th these issues can be worked around, but there are issues. So again, in this case, uh, I think we have to give the victory to TypeScript. And I mean, this shouldn't be surprising because whenever you're going from JavaScript to TypeScript, yeah, well, uh, you're going from like apples to better apples, okay? So uh, TypeScript is deliberately designed to exploit the, uh, the uh, unique flexibility. Can we put it that way, Eamon? You know, the, the, uh, the unique flexibility of the, uh, the, the JavaScript type system, you know? Whereas uh, Kotlin was, of course, originally designed to make the best of the, the JVM type system. So with TypeScript, you're going from apples to better apples. Uh, from Kotlin, you're going from apples to oranges, you know? So there's always going to be a limitation and what tools like Ducat can do for you. So cheers, Garth. Uh, so sort of continuing that, let's look at how we can actually build React UIs because uh, that's quite a common scenario that we, uh, we, we use JavaScript for and TypeScript for. And let's see how we can do that in Kotlin JS and it uses a DSL. So if you're not familiar with React, it has this technology that it uses called JSX, which allows us to put HTML-like tags or HTML-like structures into our code. So you can see that this is actually inside a function and it's just been returned by the function. So we can use these anywhere where we need an expression. So in a return statement here and an assignment passed into a function, returned out of a function. Um, and it's a bit jarring the first time you see it, or it certainly was for me. But then when you see the translation, the translation from this into uh, a function call is, is actually very, very trivial. And it's just a very elegant way of 
defining these structures um, in a sort of very succinct syntax. And if you're working with designers and people who are, you know, building HTML and CSS for a living, um, the, the, the reuse there and the accessibility is, is quite high. So this is a really nice way of building UIs. And the fact that you can interleave code and, and UI building is just a, a nice solution. But this is what it looks like in Kotlin JS. And, you know, it's not, you know, you can see the structure here. And this is actually a very, very cool feature of Kotlin JS, the fact that we can do this. This is not built specifically for React. This is just built using core functionality within the Kotlin language. So the Kotlin language allows us to build domain specific languages for, for any domain. Uh, the Gradle DSL is an example. This is a React version, okay? So the fact that we can do this at all is really, really impressive and a testament to the language. It uses a few features of the language. so. We're using the fact that this is an ex we can build extension functions or extension methods. So these allow us to augment types that we can't or or don't want to uh, uh, manually change. Uh, so here we're basically creating a div function that can be operated upon like a method on any R builder. Okay. Uh, we also have optional parameters, and here we're providing a default value, and we can have lambdas uh, being passed around. And when the lambda is the last parameter, you can put the lambda outside of the function. And if the function has no other parameters, then uh, you can leave out the brackets. And that's what allows us to create this structure down here, where we have a div with just braces. It looks sort of like a keyword of the language or a feature of the language, but it's not. It's just a normal function call that happens to take a parameter, which it's which is a lambda. Um, and the lambda actually goes further. The lambda actually is a lambda with receiver, which is this uh, dot syntax that precedes it here. And what that does is that when the function, the lambda is invoked, it will have as its context, or it's this, another R builder object. So the fact that div is an extension on R builder and inside this lambda, that this context is going to be in our builder, it means that we can build these tree structures, which is why we can build this nested structure. Label, input, all of these are extensions on that R builder, and they're really they're they're really calling this dot label and this dot input. Uh, but again, all built using core features of the language, and you can build domain specific languages for anything you want. So this is this is really, really cool. But if we sort of look a wee bit deeper and we sort of compare it maybe unfairly to JSX, there are some issues. They're a bit cumbersome here. Benedict Cumberbatch is saying they're a bit cumbersome here. Uh, where you have to use uh, operator overloads to try and keep this, the syntax succinct, but attach content to our elements, which just looks a wee bit clunky. Uh, to have a flexible list of attributes, we have to nest them inside this atters block, which again is a little bit clunky. Uh, we have to put in that extension method syntax while in JSX and, and TypeScript, you just create functions and that's it. As long as it is a capital letter, uh, you're, you're good. Uh, so that's a little bit clunky. But the main one that I want to focus on is the types of, of some of these attributes here. So if we look at this input, uh, what I'd really like to do is pass in min and max as values here. And if you look at the actual value, I'm taking a number and I'm actually having to do a two string on it. And this is really because Kotlin doesn't have type unions or type intersections, okay? So the TypeScript system is geared towards interoperating with JavaScript. And it has a feature of what a lot of functional languages have where we can have algebraic data types. So min and max here can be a number or a string. It can be either one. And the type system will keep you safe. It'll make sure that it'll only let you do numbers, number things when you've made sure it's a number. And it'll only let you do string things when you've made sure it's a string. So you have type safety, but also this flexibility, which works well with the JavaScript's, uh, let's say, freer uh, uh, sort of syntax. Um, and you can see values even more complicated. It's a string or an array of string or a, a number. And you do more things with TypeScript. You can create intersections on the fly. So this is taking a type P and merging it with another type that has a children field. So it's basically allowing us to programmatically create types. Uh, and this is really, really powerful. Library writers can, can use this really, really effectively to keep you safe, uh, but also provide flexibility. And you can use this in your own code to remove a lot of code redundancy because you can generate types from other types. So it's really, really powerful. If we look at what Ducat does as a first pass of, of uh, uh, trying to ad adapt to this, um, we get a mixed bag. For the union, it's not too bad. We've got a first or second type here. Okay, uh, and that's been passed as an input and as an output to these functions. The input is fine. It does function overloads. And this is actually an, another plus for Kotlin. 
and that it supports true overloads while TypeScript only has like pseudo overloads. Uh, so that works quite well. But in the output, we've got a problem because we can't represent both types coming out. So we have to do it as a, a dynamic here, which is a bit of a pain. If we look at the intersection, we again got a problem. We've got first and second, but what we compute here or what we generate out is just first. So we lose all of that second type definition, which is which is a bit of a pain. Um, we see this in some of the wrappers that you can work around it. So in use effect hook here, there's there's a union inside this type definition when you're using it in TypeScript. Uh, to work around that, what they've done when they've wrapped it up is basically created two functions. So there's a use effect and a separate function, use effect or cleanup, and that's handled by one function in JavaScript ultimately. And it can be handled by one function in TypeScript using its advanced type system. And the TypeScript can, can, can do more. I mean, Garth already talked a little bit about map types, uh, which we're not going to go into. Uh, conditionals, which allow you to choose uh, uh, between two types based on some other type uh, conditions that you can do. And these things are really, 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 really powerful. And, and the type system is getting more and more powerful with every release, in fact. Um, so, you know, if I compare the JSX to DSL and just look at it just as that uh, argument, the, the Kotlin is more flexible um, and you can use it for more things, but the JSX is just a more elegant solution for building React. And TypeScript's advanced type system is really powerful and useful in lots of other scenarios outside of React and outside of JSX. Uh, and I do miss it when I go to languages that don't have it. It's brilliant for removing redundancy, but retaining uh, safety and programmatically generating types. Cool. Correct. So uh, if we go, go on to, uh, to round four and let's talk about concurrency. So of course, JavaScript and TypeScript are extremely strong here because they have the async and await keywords. So we can declare a function as being async and then we can await the result of a function that returns a promise and that makes it much easier to work with asynchronous concurrent code and so on. However, yeah, uh, Kotlin has uh, coroutines and the suspend keyword and this is even more powerful. So we can declare uh, a function as being a suspending function. And then you can see there if we're calling into like JavaScript, we can just do the await. But let's say we've got one suspending function calling into another. Well, then uh, we don't need that await keyword at all. It's just uh, all handled automatically for us. Yep. So uh, uh, you see here what we're doing is we've got a suspending function called load map, and then we're saying client.get. And that call to client.get, that actually comes from the HTTP client provided by Ktor. Yeah. The, uh, the the Kotlin microservices framework. So that's um, another suspending function. Yeah. So if you like the, uh, the the awaiting is automatic, as you can tell from the uh, the little arrow that IntelliJ puts on the uh, the left hand side there. And what you're actually doing is you're creating a new co-routing. And uh, that, that opens the door to all kinds of incredible possibilities, which we don't have time to talk about at the moment. But suffice to say, that's a, that's a massive expansion point. You can do a lot more there than just basic concurrency. Cool. Uh, so then uh, round five, uh, let's just talk about the elegance of the syntax and how much fun they are to use. OK, uh, so um, Kotlin has a, a really strong story here because um, uh, in Kotlin, more things are expressions. OK, so the if and the when, these are expressions. They actually return things. Uh, you don't avoid. You have unit, which is much nicer. You have uh, expression bodied functions. Uh, you know that this creates just nicer code at the end of the day. So if we take an example here, uh, let's say you're doing JSX. Uh, one of the things you have to learn very on when you start doing JSX is uh, you can't do ifs. You can't do switches. You can't do loops, you know, because those things aren't expressions. Yeah. So uh, if you want to do conditionals, you have to use the uh, the ternary conditional operator, the question mark conditional, and kind of chain it like this. Yeah. If you want to do iteration, well, then you have to do it through your functional programming constructs, through your maps and your filters and so on. So that's a that's a pain point. Yeah. Whereas if you think about Kotlin, well, uh, you see here we're using uh, when within the DSL, and uh, we can do that because when is an expression. You know, the, the when statement is going to return something. So the, uh, the, the resulting code is simpler, it's more symmetrical, it's nicer, you know. So there's a, there's a win for Kotlin there. 
Um, but it doesn't all go Kotlin's way. I mean, both TypeScript and Kotlin support destructuring, and this is wonderful, okay? Uh, it's one of these things that, you know, once you've used it a little bit, you get really angry if a language doesn't support it. So destructuring is just the ability to go to an array or list and say, I want the first three things and just those, or to go to an object and say, okay, uh, I want the properties called foobar Z and none of the other dozen properties and so on. So Kotlin supports this, but you kind of have to ask for it. You you know, it's implemented through uh, what are called component end methods. So you, you get it for free if you declare a class as a data class, but you have to do that declaration and so on. Whereas in TypeScript, it's just there, you know, so what we can do it with any object. Yeah. So you see here, I can say const value color equals brick. So I want to go to the brick object and just lift out uh, the values of those two properties and store them in variables of the same name. And uh, you can do it uh, on parameters, which is absolutely wonderful, you know. So let's say it's a complex object that's being passed in, but for the purposes of the function or arrow, we only need three things from it. So you can do structuring in your parameter lists, which looks really weird the first time you see it, but very soon it becomes, you know, addictive. It's really, really useful. And uh, it's incredibly powerful with arrays and data structures and so on, you know. So yes, they both have it, uh, but it's a lot more flexible in uh, in TypeScript. Cool. So what's, what's our conclusion? Um, they're both really, really good but in different ways, okay? They, they both are excellent languages and Kotlin JS as an offering in the JavaScript space is, is actually very, very good. This whole talk is from a obviously longer talk and we've, we've cut it down, but like it was just tit for tat in terms of who was winning uh, when we looked at different aspects and you could weight them differently and your mileage will vary depending on the kinds of applications you're building and how you're using it. But when you're using one, you will miss features from the other and vice versa. Uh, so it's not uh, just clear cut. TypeScript has, a, has obviously a legacy and a few years in this space. So it'll be interesting to see what happens over time. For me, I'm a cautious person by nature. Um, and just as an engineer building a new product, I would be going with the safer choice, which is TypeScript mainly because of the community and the number of people that are already using it. And I will be able to go and find more answers on Stack Overflow for JavaScript and JavaScript platform based problems in that community. I'm just, that's, that's just, it's just history. It's just the way it is, but you will miss features from, uh, from Kotlin when you're in TypeScript. And if you are working in TypeScript, or working in Kotlin on the server, say, you'll miss some of the features in TypeScript as well. So it's not clear cut, but cautiousness would probably push me towards TypeScript. But it'll be interesting to see how these things develop. Kotlin JS, you know, there's new features out. There's a new release there. Uh, there's a new alpha uh, uh, backend compiler. Uh, we're getting improved code emitting and bundle size, which was an issue and that's improving. It's still maybe just not totally there yet, but it's it's improving all the time. It's generating TypeScript definition files for you automatically. So you can pick those up if you want to write Kotlin and then consume it from TypeScript or JavaScript. Obviously, more multi-platform libraries from Kotlin will be able to be consumed for the JS platform because that code can work anywhere. And eventually, they're they're looking to target WebAssembly as well. So there's lots to watch out for there. Um, but yeah, it's not a clear-cut thing. 